Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Joel Knighton, and today I'm going to talk about testing Apache Cassandra with Jepson and how you can apply those techniques uh, to testing your own systems. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Joel Knighton, or if you use the hashtag testing Cassandra DevOps, I'll give it a look after the talk and answer any questions or comments. So here's the schedule. First, I'm going to talk about the practical. I'm going to talk about what we did how we used Jepson to test Cassandra, what we learned, what the results were. Then I'm going to go to the plans. This is when we move past the experience report and look at how we're going to introduce what we learned from Jepson testing into our process and actually incorporate it into the regular development process of Apache Cassandra. Then we're going to move on to the pitch. That's where I tell you why you should use Jepson to test your distributed systems. And then we're going to move on to the philosophical, which is where I'll share some thoughts on why I think this style of testing is so important. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, I'm a mathematician. My education is in finite model theory, which is the mathematics that serve as the foundation of query languages like SQL or Datalog. Um, I'm also a software hobbyist. I'm not educated in software in terms of a degree, but it's something I've been doing for a long time. I'm a logic enthusiast, both in traditional, classical, mathematical logic and in newer, non-traditional logics. And I'm an open source Apache Cassandra developer at Datastax. So my day-to-day -day work is improving open source Apache Cassandra. So the practical. There are a number of ways we test Apache Cassandra. The first way we use and kind of the first, uh, first defense we have against bugs is unit tests. And those are really easy to run. We can run them on all of our development machines. And they're using a conventional testing framework. We can just run ant tests. They're JUnit tests. They're going to run on forked JVMs. And those are a really efficient entry way to test small, isolated components. So we can test things like commit log replay, test things like serialization, deserialization, all those core functions you expect to work in a database. But when you're working on a distributed database, that type of you know, individual JVM testing doesn't really cover what you need to ensure that your database works as expected. So we have another way we test Apache Cassandra. And those we call distributed tests. And those are also open source, but they don't live in tree. And what a distributed test is, is a way to test a real Cassandra cluster. So it uses a framework called CCM that spins up multiple Cassandra processes on a local node. And it actually orchestrates that cluster and exercises it as any client application would. So that's a really good way to test parts of Cassandra that really rely on coordination between services, between JVMs, and actually test the messaging service, all of those intercomponent connections. And those are really easy to run, too. They're you know, normal Python tests. We can run them using nodes. We can run them on our local boxes. But distributed tests still don't really cover the whole space of Apache Cassandra. And the reason is that they really only excel at exploring targeted paths. There might be things you can think of that you want your database to work. We can write these 10 records. We can bootstrap a node. We can decommission a node. We can change these settings and expect to read those 10 records back. But reading and writing 10 records isn't a representative workload. And individually writing all of those different ways to exercise a cluster is not feasible. So we need to look for a way that we can really explore those explosive complexities of a distributed system in time, in space, and in configuration. And so that's the plan with Jepson. And that's probably why you're here. I know Jepson is popular. It's taken the distributed systems world by storm. You might know Jepson as a couple different things, all of them driven by Kyle Kingsbury and best read about at his website. It's a blog series about distributed systems behavior. And these blog posts span from the theoretical, in which Kyle digests all of these complicated you know, concepts from all of these academic distributed systems papers and distills them down into uh, ideas that an application developer can apply. You might know it as a talk series about distributed systems behavior, exploring many of the same concepts as these blog posts. You might know it as a closure library to test the behavior of distributed systems, or you might know it as a collection of tests written using those libraries. So what I'm going to talk about today is the practical of using that closure library to write new tests that we can use to test Apache Cassandra. So what we hope is that Jepson and Cassandra get along. And I don't mean that in some marketing sense. Yes, it is a good marketing blog post to say Jepson and Cassandra, it works great. But as developers, 
we don't really necessarily care about a green test dashboard if it doesn't actually help us to produce better software. So when I say we hope that Jepson gets along with Cassandra, what I mean is that the style of testing that Jepson employs helps us develop a more stable Apache Cassandra. So I wrote Jepson tests for Cassandra. They're open source again, available at Riptano on GitHub. Uh, they're easy to run. We can run them on local machines using line test, and we can digest those results however we want. They're just closure unit tests. So I'm going to look at the actual structure of a Jepson test now and what it is. So a Jepson test has three key properties. It's generative. It relies on randomized testing to better explore more of the state space of a distributed system. It's black box. It observes the system at client boundaries. It doesn't rely on any special tracing framework. It doesn't need any modifications to Apache Cassandra or any other system you might be testing. And it relies on invariants. It's going to check invariants from a recorded history rather than checking them at runtime. So a test in Jepson is just a data structure that encapsulates all of these properties. It's going to have a name that we're going to use to name results and store them on the file system. It's going to have an implementation of an OS protocol that's going to do any orchestration or setup you need of the operating system. It's going to have an implementation of a database protocol. What that's going to do is configure, start, and stop the database throughout the test as necessary. It's going to have an implementation of some client protocol that instructs the clients how to exercise the cluster under test. It's going to have a generator that generates data, that generative property, that will be used in both the clients and the conductors. It's going to have conductors, including the specialized nemesis, that interact with the environment. And it's going to have a checker that looks at all of this information recorded after the end of the test and checks it for some properties, whether they're specific academic invariants, like linearizability or strict serializability, or whether they're more simple properties, like everything I add to a set should be in that set. So when you're running Jepson, what you need is one machine that's going to run the orchestration software and n machines to run Cassandra or the database under test. Thank you. No problem. All right. Um, so this one machine is going to run all of your client and conductor workloads, and it's going to interact with those nodes under test, either through the connections in OS or database setup over SSH, or through your client workload, which is going to be something like a driver, typically. So the test lifecycle in Jepson is relatively simple. First, you're going to go through that OS setup. It's going to use shared SSH connections across all of your nodes under test, and it's going to apply any setup it needs to those nodes. Then you're going to use the database protocol to set up and configure your database as necessary. This is when you'll install the database, build the database, set any configuration options, and start the service. Then you have the meat of the test itself, the actual workload that's going to create information that you need to evaluate. So it's going to consist of a couple things. There's going to be your, uh, your orchestration node that's going to have a thread for each client and a thread for your nemesis or conductors. And here you can see the stream of generated data. So the, that generated data, which is going to have instructions like read or write a value or disrupt the nodes in this way, is going to be used to drive those client and nemesis threads. So when a client or a nemesis is done with a behavior, it's just going to ask for the next one. And that's how you can create these sophisticated patterns to exercise the cluster. So here you can see you might be reading or writing from the cluster, or you might be disrupting a node by crashing it or partitioning its network. After all of these operations have been conducted, you're going to have a concurrent recorded history that explains the chronological behavior of the test. You're going to see when threads read a value, when threads wrote a value, and those are all going to be expressed as windows, a time when that operation started and a time when that operation finished. And those windows are what's going to allow you to evaluate whether or not the c concurrent behavior of a test is correct. So after that test is run, that history is recorded, we're going to run any checkers attached to the test. And a checker can do a couple things. It can produce a judgment on the validity of a result, or it can produce some artifact to help you explain or understand a result. So you might have a latency checker that visualizes 
uh, client latency throughout the test. Or you might have a simple validity judgment, such as, yes, this value that was written was successfully read. So now I'm going to go through the deep dive of a single test and explain each of those components in the form of a specialized implementation. So here you can see the invocation you use to run a typical Jepson test. Something like line test only, Cassandra collection set test, a namespace for all sets or all tests for CQL sets, and then something like a description of what exactly it's testing. So we're going to test sets under isolating nodes with concurrent decommissions. So you'll have a single test name that's compositional and is used to record artifacts of that test on the file system. So you might have something like Cassandra CQL set isolate node decommission. And the underlines there are to highlight that the tests are compositional and we can build them up by separate parts. Since they're a data structure, we can have a simple base Cassandra set that is going to share all of those operating system and database implementations. We can merge that with the CQL set, which has the clients that will exercise a CQL set. And we could further merge that with these conductors and checkers that are going to isolate a node, decommission the cluster, and then evaluate whether these properties held. The next thing we have is a set of nodes under test. This is a simple list of host names that will resolve to all of your nodes. We'll have an implementation of a network protocol. The network protocol is meant to encapsulate a set of meaningful operations that simulate failure conditions of a real world network. So we'll have something like drop, which will use IP tables to simply drop packets between hosts. We'll have heal, which will heal any network instabilities. Slow, which will use TC to introduce delays in the network. Flaky, which will introduce drops in the form of packet loss into the network. And fast, which will resolve any delays. So we can use these properties in this specific IP tables implementation to disrupt the network during our test. We'll have an implementation of an OS protocol. In uh, the main Jepson repository, the implementations available are Debian and SmartOS. And this will include things like adjusting the host file, updating the package manager, installing any base packages, this, any operating system level orchestration that sets up a system for test. We'll have an implementation of a DB protocol. In the case of Cassandra, it will shut down and wipe Cassandra if running install, configure, and start Cassandra, and at the end of the test, shut down, wipe Cassandra, and return the path to log files so that they can be archived for further analysis. We're going to have an implementation of a client protocol. This is one of the most important parts of the test. What a client protocol does is turns those abstract operations into specific instructions and actual actions to exercise a cluster under test. So the client will set up by creating a connection to nodes and creating any schema for the types of data that we're testing. And for each operation from that generator, it will call invoke. And invoke will have different behaviors depending on the type of that operation. So for a CQL set test, where a CQL set is a simple set data structure implemented in terms of the Cassandra database, we might want to add a value, which will run CQL set to add to set and handle errors as necessary, or it might have a read instruction, which will read the value of the CQL set. And this invoke function is going to return a value that will be appended onto that history. So for example, in the case of a CQL set add, we might return an OK if the driver tells us that we have successfully added the, the data to the set. We might return an info if we have some unknown condi condition, such as a write timeout, where the data might have been added, or we might simply return fail. If we have something like an unavailable exception, the cluster is down, we want to also record that on the history and say we know that data shouldn't have been added. And then we have a generator. Generators are one of the most powerful parts of Jepson in that they're the core abstraction to work with non-determinism in your tests. So there's a simple generator language that we can use in Jepson, and we can build these generators up out of relatively simple closure functions. So we have this top-level generator phases, and what that's going to do 
is establish a sequence of blocking phases that the test will move through. So each of these phases are not concurrent, but we can have concurrency within these phases. So in our first phase, we're going to generate a stream of ads that we want to perform to the database. And that's where we can introduce specific values that we want to add. It could be something as simple as an ascending sequence. It could be alternating. Whatever structure you need to explore a specific part of your read-write path. Then we're going to introduce some staggering between those values so that we don't have a uniform distribution. We might want non-uniform pauses in these to better simulate client workloads. We can introduce a delay on top of that, which is where we can control throughput of the generator. And then we might apply some standard generator. And that's where we can have generators that embody shared properties that we want to do. So in my case, a standard generator might say, oh yeah, and stop returning values after 10 minutes, and while you're at it, partition the network. And then after all of that phase is done, we're going to move on to the final blocking phase of the test, which is going to be an aggressive attempt to read the value of the CQL set. So this is when we say, OK, we're done writing to the cluster, but we need to read from the cluster to have some baseline to compare our read writes against. And that's when we execute that read once. A test is also going to have conductors. Conductors are what we use to manipulate the environment. In the core Jepson repo, there's nemesis, and a nemesis is a single thread that manipulates the environment. But in testing Apache Cassandra, one of the core things we want to accomplish is testing these invariants while we're manipulating the cluster in different ways. So in our fork, we generalize that to the conductor abstraction, which simply spins up a thread for every specified conductor implementation. So in the case of this CQL set test, we're going to have a nemesis implementation that will partition a random node from the network, and we're going to have a conductor implementation that will decommission or remove nodes from the cluster. So this is where we can implement any orchestration we want. This is separate from your values under test and manipulates instead the environment under test. A conductor, in terms of protocol, is just another client. It also has a setup, an invoke, and a teardown. The distinction in terms of the Jepson runtime is that a client automatically spins up n copies, where, an, where n is the number of nodes under test, whereas a conductor or a nemesis only has a single thread. And then finally, we'll have a test checker. You can think of this as your generalized assert. This is where you're going to read the history and make a series of judgments about its validity. So in the case of a set checker, we're going to look at the history of that run. We're going to find all successful writes and add that to a successful set. We're going to find all unknown or uncertain writes and add that to an unknown set. And we're going to compare these to the final read. So if we, in our final read, find a value that isn't in the OK or unknown sets, that's a failure because we never meant to write it to the cluster. Whereas if we find a read that's in our unknown set or our OK set, that's OK. And finally, we want to make sure that all of our OK writes are, in fact, in the red set. So that's where we have that specific granularity judgment of OK writes, lost writes, unexpected writes, or recovered writes. So there's lots of invariants you can express in these checkers. And there are a number of checkers that we use to test Apache Cassandra. The first, the one explained in this single test deep dive, is whether CQL collections such as maps and sets merge cleanly when add only. When we're testing a data structure like a map or a set, we expect that if we wrote value A to node 1 and we wrote value B to node 2, if we repair any uh, partitions or failures in the cluster, we expect to read both A and B. There shouldn't be any problem in merging this. Another invariant we test is whether counters merge to accurately reflect increments and decrements. After Cassandra 2.1, we expect that counters are going to preserve those properties. We want them to be failure resistant. We want counters to be accurate in the case of partitions or node crashes. Uh, a specific property that we want to test is whether lightweight transactions in a sing single data center allow us linearizability. Linearizability is a well-founded concept. We know what linearizability means in terms of the distributed systems literature. And there's a linearizability checker bundled with Jepson in the form of Nosos, also implemented by Kyle Kingsbury. Uh, 
We can test whether materialized views converge to matching the base table. In Cassandra 3.0, we implemented a feature called materialized views, where you can automatically add data to another table based on some base table. And we expect that those should eventually resolve over time. And we can also test whether logged batched writes get applied atomically. A logged batch, in terms of Cassandra, uh, bundles two writes together and distributes them across the cluster so that we repeatedly try to write it until we see that both of those wrotes, writes resolve successfully. So we can test that property using a checker, using a similar pattern to the CQL collections of writing multiple values and reading at the end of the test. We can also test a variety of failures concurrent with any of these checkers. It's important that the failures are separate from the checkers so that we preserve that compositionality of tests. We can test how this works under a variety of network partitions. Under the Jepson repo, network partitions implemented includes bridge partitions, where we have two quorums joined by a node, a quorum partition, where we have a quorum and a non-quorum of nodes, or a random single node partition. We can test that with node crashes. A node crash can be in the form of a hard kill nine or an order shutdown. We can test that in form uh, concurrently with nodes flushing or compacting. In a structure like, or in a program like a database, you're going to have multiple concurrent operations that are parallel on a single node, such as reading and writing, uh, servicing read and reads and writes, or flushing memory to disk, or compacting two structures on the disk together. And we want to preserve these properties while all of those operations are happening concurrently. We can test this when nodes are being bootstrapped or added to the cluster. We can test these properties when nodes are being decommissioned or removed from the cluster. And we can test this while clocks drift. Clock drift is another important failure to consider when testing distributed systems. So running these tests is relatively simple. You can start your Docker container, which will run six internal nodes, the source node in terms of the Docker container, and five LXC nodes that will be your systems under test. Uh, you can install the Java driver, a closure wrapper for the Java driver, a closure wrapper for SSH, and Jepson itself in the container. You can use environment variables to point to the build under test so that we can test individual source builds. And then we simply run line test with any desired selectors or profiles. Selectors and profiles in terms of the line engine build tool allow you to isolate and run individual sets of tests. So we can easily say something like, run all of the tests that have decommissions in them, or run all of the tests that have bootstraps in them. We also have a variety of tunable options that we can use with, with our Jepson tests. And this is really important, because while a Jepson test can explore the state, spi state space of client operations, it's not going to automatically explore the state space of configuration. Tunable options include thoughts like, should we make a best effort attempt to scale test length. In our Jepson test, we have a simple function that reads some environment variable and can be used to scale any sort of constant scaling factors. And we use that uh, in terms of test length so that we can run longer duration tests, shorter duration tests. We can say whether we should enable specific Cassandra options like commit log compression, the coordinator batch log on materialized views, or hinted handoff. These are all database internal configuration settings that may meaningfully impact whether we successfully deliver the guarantees we hope to users. So we should be able to configure these when we're running our test and make no modifications to the test itself. We can test something like whether a different compaction strategy or phi value in the failure detector is appropriate for the test. And these may be dependent on the test itself. We can install from a tagged release, a URL pointing to a tarball or a local tarball. And we can also have debug options, like should we leave Cassandra running after the test? In the process of uh, developing these Jepson tests, I often found that these failure modes we were introducing would leave the environment in unknown conditions. And debugging these unknown conditions was very challenging without the option to simply say, don't do this teardown. Just leave me an environment that I can manually explore. So here's sort of the experience log of the type of issues we found with this style of testing. Generative black box testing that acknowledges real world failure conditions. The first is a simple issue with counter undercounting, overcounting. So this is an example where a checker doing something as simple as checking whether a number is greater or smaller than a number can really expose underlying issues in the database. 
We have decommissioned race conditions causing gossip problems. This is one of my favorite failures that we found using Jepson testing because it really exemplifies the type of issue that you're unlikely to find by devising your own test that explores a, st a specific test. So in this case, we were decommissioning a node concurrently with node crashes. And we found that if a node crashed at a specific time after a decommission, that decommission may be present in the commit log, where we store metadata about the commission, but not in the flush structures on disk. And then when we restarted those nodes, because we were looking at those structures before we replayed the commit log, we were missing that updated metadata about the decommission. So here's a case where maybe one out of 50, one out of 100 times, you might see this issue only if you have multiple concurrent failures happening at the same time as the system being under use. And that's not the type of thing that's easily found using a unit test or an integration test. Uh, we found write durability violations when recovering commit log. This is an example of a failure that was also reproduced in our unit tests but was found in our Jepson tests, which is reassuring because it tells us that we're catching the simple failures. We're not uh, missing the forest for the trees in some sense by only looking at our recorded history. Uh, we found problems with encoding of SS tables. We found problems with batch log replay, replay failures after decommission and crash. That's another case where these concurrent nemeses and conductors exposed underlying failures that simply could not have been exposed in a unit test. Uh, we found a case of incorrect asserts in the counter right path when timestamps collide. This is another one of my favorite issues. So this is a case where we had a certain volume of counter writes occurring, hitting a part of the read write path that we weren't in any specific integration test. And by hitting that, we were hitting an assert, an assert that in fact did not result in an error in the log, but meaningfully changed the data that was written to the database. So a high-level test like perform these operations, look for an error in the database log would not have caught this. But the CQL set test that tested for added elements and then a final read immediately identified this problem before this commit was merged to the actual source repository. Uh, there were a variety of materialized view issues during development. As I'm sure you can imagine, in a distributed system that attempts to automatically distribute data across the cluster, there are a number of failure modes that can uh, introduce surprising consequences. And again, testing frameworks that acknowledge real world failures will help find those. And then another issue of metric overflows in certain read write paths. This is one that I like because it's meaningfully different than these above issue, than these uh, uh, preceding issues. The seven issues above are issues that are frankly kind of scary. You want your database to successfully persist data. This is an observability issue that we found in the process of writing our tests themselves. When we're looking for ways to record data about a system under test onto the history so it could be checked after, we found that certain parts of the read-write path could introduce invalid values into metric calculation. So we had an insane metric recorded onto the history that clearly could not be valid, causing an overflow in the calculation of a histogram. If we were recording those values ourselves using some introspection framework or some tracing framework, we might not have found this. But instead, we found this failure in visibility before a user could. We shared a number of parts of this work. Uh, we have several upstream fixes or features to Jepson, uh, Docker support to run the tests, multi-box vagrant support to run the tests, uh, some smaller fixes, and smart OS support for both the OS and network protocols. Uh, as I mentioned, Docker images to run the tests, they're available, available on Docker Hub. Uh, multi-box vagrant configurations to run Jepson tests. This is particularly relevant if you're a user of JVM software. In terms of uh, databases, there are a lot of databases that you can use something like libfaketime to inter uh, intercept syscalls and simulate clock drift. But in terms of the JVM, libfaketime often introduces considerable instability or uh, outright failures. So to better simulate clock drift, you do in fact need distinct virtual machines rather than separate Linux containers. Uh, we contributed upstream library fixes. This is a rather funny case of Jepson testing Jepson. 
In the process of simulating executing diverse commands across the cluster, we found a bug in the closure SSH library that wraps a uh, Java SSH library where a command finishing before the uh, connection being fully established could result in lingering hanging connections. Uh, the Cassandra Jepson tests themselves are open source on GitHub, and on CASCI, a continuous integration service that we use in the development of Apache Cassandra, we have templates to run these Jepson tests. You can see these here. They use a simple line engine plugin called Test2JUnit that takes these closure tests and turns them into individual JUnit tests that we can explore using this uh, Jenkins UI. So that's the practical. That's what it means to write a Jepson test. That's an example of Jepson tests. But that's not all I have today. Here are some lessons we learned from that. We learned that tests verifying invariants under failures are both valuable and practical. We found several meaningful issues in the database, and we found them rather easily. We found that these tests can and should be a part of regular development. Using some system like Vagrant or Docker, it's relatively easy to simulate these multi-node tests on your own development machine. We found that testing complex systems is hard, but there are low-hanging fruit. Checkers as simple as a set data structure checker did, in fact, find errors. We found that Jepson provides one readily available way to accomplish this goal. At the outset, we weren't sure how much time we'd be spending fixing Jepson. We really didn't spend much. We found that Jepson as a library is capable and stable. We found that considering invariance against a recorded test run is effective. At the outset, I wasn't sure whether writing all this data to a history and checking it afterward would be an effective way to write a test. It seemed to me that I'd be wanting to make judgments at runtime, but instead I found that this recorded test run approach encourages you to not make specific alterations and act as a user, operate as a user, and make judgments afterward. Uh, finally, I found that invariants should be explicit and carefully considered in design. One of the most strenuous parts of writing these tests was reverse engineering how exactly we meant to behave in some situations. It's not always easy to make a judgment as to what properties should be preserved under multiple concurrent failures. So here are the plans. We found these tests worked. We had some simple one-off tests. But we want to learn what we can from these tests and incorporate, in, or incorporate those lessons into our regular development process. Here are some of the things we want and our plans to get them. Pluggable provisioning and configuration management, shared resource pools, extensive log collection, ad hoc analysis, artifact checking, and declarative test definitions. I'm now going to talk about why those modifications to Jepson style testing are desirable. Provisioning is error prone and can be shared. We spent a lot of time developing these SSH-based, closure-driven uh, modification of configuration options that often wasn't quite stable and duplicated efforts we already had internally to automatically provision, sy provision systems using uh, traditional provisioning configuration management. So where possible, I advise you to reuse those efforts instead of developing these uh, one-off Jepson solutions. Uh, another reason this is very important is that the configuration space for databases is huge and relevant. Apache Cassandra, and almost certainly the, the database you're using, has a plethora of options for commit log behavior, for concurrency within the database, and each of those can meaningfully impact your, delivery, or your ability to deliver guarantees to your users. Uh, why shared resources? We continually found that new issues surfaced as tests grew in size and grew in duration. And so we need an ability to run these tests outside of the developer machine and on larger clusters for longer periods of time. We also found that hardware is varied and expensive, and so where possible, should be used by multiple developers. Why log collection? One of the penalties of this history approach and post hoc checking is that it's hard to know what information is needed in advance, and test results can be hard to reproduce. So we found t it's better to err on the side of aggression in log collection, and collect logs not just from the database, but from the operating system, from your provisioning system. Anything that can help reveal data that might debug these issues. Why ad hoc analysis? 
Checkers have bugs, and test results can be expensive to reproduce. It's important to maintain the abstraction and make it easy to run a checker over an older history. This helps to bisect issues, identify their origin date, and further revise your criteria for validity. Why artifact checking? Not all information about your system under test fits neatly on a chronological history. It's silly to serialize a data-heavy component like an SS table that has no meaningful time concept onto a chronological history. Uh, we also want to be able to check our logs for errors. Although they might not embody some complex invariant like linearizability, high severity errors in logs are almost always relevant and may identify issues sooner. We also have existing testing tools that produce artifacts. We have stress tools in Apache Cassandra, like Cassandra Stress, and in retrofitting those artifacts onto the history, we reproduce work we've already done. Why declarative tests? Uh, many times we found it tempting to introduce locks or other synchronization into a Jepson test to produce some behavior. At the end of the day, we found that introduction of coordination in tests simply made it harder and limited the amount of variability you had in the tests. So we should use these declarative tests to encourage simple test design and discourage coordination. Also, we can still support an escape hatch as long as these declarative tests map onto a runtime that we can still write to directly. So the pitch. Why should you use a testing framework like this? You're probably building or using a distributed system. Ways you might be. Are you using a container or a VM scheduler? That control plane almost certainly coordinates during runtime. That control plane almost certainly relies on a distributed database to store metadata about the containers or VMs being scheduled. Uh, do you rely on a distributed data, spo data store like Apache Cassandra? That will almost inevitably be, dis uh, be susceptible to real-world failure conditions. Is there a distributed queue in your architecture? It's more and more common to see systems like Kafka being used for event processing. Do you have multiple application servers or clients? If those application servers or clients have meaningful state and calculation that's persisted, you've got a distributed system. There's also the obvious. Like me, you might be building an open source distributed data store, or you might be building a closed source distributed data store for your own uh, uses. When designing Jepson tests, there's an important question, and that's where to stop. Because a distributed system can mean a lot of things. You can have your core distributed system. You might have something like your nodes under test, and that's where you draw your observability boundary for your invariants. You're going to use some simple wire protocol, and you're going to assert things like linearizability. But beyond that, you might want to include your drivers in your concept of your distributed system. Drivers are very complex. They might have something like automated load balancing. They might have something like automated discovery of new nodes in the cluster. And those sorts of behaviors in a driver can impact uh, invariants like read your own writes within a session. So if you want to fully exercise your system, as your users might, you really need to draw your observability boundary at the drivers. You have an opportunity to go one step further. You might want to move beyond your data store, beyond your scheduler, and effectively Jepson test your whole application. You can draw your observability boundary at your application clients. There are almost certainly some properties that you want to preserve as invariants for your end users. So what to do? I highly recommend starting with Jepson. Jepson is a small, reliable implementation of these concepts. If you find severe deficiencies in Jepson for your purposes, I encourage you to consider wrapping Jepson. The runtime is easily pluggable in terms of any JVM framework. It consists of a few core abstractions that can be exported as interfaces for consumption by any JVM language. And then lastly, re-implement if necessary. In this case, I don't discourage this approach as heavily as I might otherwise. When you're looking at a framework like Jepson, the strengths lie heavily in the concepts. The wins are in generative testing, in black box testing, in failure testing, and not necessarily in the implementation itself. So the philosophical. This is where I talk a little bit about why I think these tests matter so much. The first is that these techniques do effectively test invariants. 
in our testing, we found this. In Kyle's testing, he's found this. He's, in the course of his blog posts, reproduced and described issues in a plethora of distributed systems at the core of applications you've almost certainly used or built. Jepson-style testing forces the issue. When you introduce generative inputs into your testing framework, it's not good enough to write one case that works. When you're developing a feature that relies on an invariant like linearizability, it's simply not good enough to write one case, to write two cases, to write 10 cases. There will be cases discovered in the field, field that are not effect effectively captured by your simple unit tests or integration tests. Another reason I think these tests matter so much is that they encourage generality. When you're making a judgment that must be true over all inputs and outputs, you're encouraged to step back and make high-level statements. These high-level statements are the same high-level statements that a user will evaluate when judging whether your data store can offer the behavior they need. You'll learn about your own observability. When you're using a testing strategy that draws inputs and outputs during a runtime and records them to a history, you can't get away with making dynamic runtime assertions. So in the process of discovering all of the data that you'll need to record to your history, you'll learn about how your users actually observe your system under, the test, under test. You'll learn how your users have visibility into how the system behaves, and you'll see those deficiencies in the same way that they do. Another reason is that distributed systems have a huge state space. They have a state space that grows in time as you have long-running requests, long-running behaviors that coordinate. They have a huge state space in, in physical dimension across multiple nodes, across large cr clusters. In Cassandra, we've seen a variety of issues that only occur in clusters with 100 nodes, with 200 nodes, with 300 nodes, under failure conditions that introduce something like a stampeding herd behavior. So to really explore that state space, you need to grow in time, you need to grow in space, you need to grow in faults. And lastly, scaling formal methods to heavily composed systems is an unsolved problem. You might look at something like linearizability within Cassandra and say, well, Lightweight transactions rely on Paxos, and I can model check Paxos using something like TLA plus or Alloy or Spin, but what you can't necessarily effectively use TLA plus or Alloy or Spin for is model, checks and model checking Paxos concurrently with Cassandra's gossip, concurrently with Cassandra's flushing data to disk, and those all meaningfully modify the actual behavior of the system. So until we have a way to algorithmically check how these systems compose, it looks like something like Jepson might be the best we can do in the real world. Lastly, and this is a higher level point, I think we're in an in an era of discovering guarantees from implementations. Peter Alvaro talked about this in his Strange Loop keynote from a few years ago, where databases used to be developed top down. We had a guarantee like a transaction or serializability, and our implementation might be whatever mess makes that work. But I found that in things like Cassandra and in other modern distributed data stores, we're instead saying, oh, I need this implementation. I have this messaging service, I have this messaging behavior, and whatever the user gets out of that, they get out of that. That's not good enough. As authors, we should formalize and document guarantees when possible, and JEPS enforces this issue. If you're writing a test for a guarantee, if you're writing code for a guarantee, you're already halfway there to formalizing it. And you can use that information to make recommendations to operators of your system. You can use that information to meaningfully improve your documentation, to assert those behaviors so that your users can rely on them. And as consumers, we should justify our discoveries. We're often in a position where the developers of a system don't necessarily make a guarantee, but we want to know if we can use that guarantee in developing an application that relies on that behavior. 
as a consumer of that library, when you make that judgment, you are now responsible for the failures when that behavior is not conserved. So we should, in fact, test those behaviors. It's not just authors who use something like Jepson testing. As consumers of distributed systems, we should justify the compositional properties of that distributed system with our own application. So a few people to thank. Uh, my coworker Jake at Datastax uh, helped me with his Jepson testing. We collaborated on it. Uh, Datastax and the Cassandra community have been very helpful in providing examples for these tests, in providing motivating uh, demonstrations of some ways failures might occur. Kyle Kingsbury for developing the library and DevOps UK for having me here to talk about it. Uh, and now questions. Here are a few things I'm interested in if you want to talk to me after. Otherwise, I can field questions now. Yeah, so the question was that we have this big long list of issues we've found through Jepson testing and that we've fixed. You know, we've closed the issue, we've implemented something. But how do we make that judgment call about whether the issue is truly fixed when, by the nature of generative testing and the generators we've used, we might not explore that exact path again? Uh, that's a very good question. So the practical reality of writing Jepson tests is that when we have those one-off failures, we do the best we can to trace them to a specific issue. We write a unit test for it, and we have that as sort of a way to explore that specific path again. Uh, an alternative is if we have some level of reproducibility. If this happens five times out of 50, if this happens 20 times out of 50, we might know to look for those in the future. Uh, one area of research around this that I think is really promising is something called lineage-driven fault injection by Peter Alvaro. And the distinction there is it removes the black box element from the system under test. So when we're doing black box testing of something like Jepson, uh, we like it because it's practical. We don't have to instrument our system. But to truly reproduce these generative tests, we would have to introduce instrumentation along all meaningful algorithmic parts of that path, something like sending a network. Another advantage of that sort of uh, fault injection lineage-driven tracing approach is that you gain the ability to replay those traces. If you have a tracing system that can effectively instrument that, you can run that instrumentation in reverse. Uh, it's worth noting that although the code is not public, that approach was adopted at Netflix in the implementation of uh, Peter's lineage-driven fault injection approach last summer, and they actually just put a paper uh, out about it next week, or next week, last week. All right, I think that's it for questions. Thanks, everyone.